this, I would say the final topic uh, is how to, to enable the performance techniques that we used already, that we, sorry, reviewed already in the last session and how to, to use the SDN assist uh, mechanism in OSM and what it's all about. So, um, using virtual interfaces, which is what we have been doing so far, we have the virtual machines spread through our infrastructure and OpenStack takes care of the interconnectivity between them when we are using the, the internal networks uh, through the local switches when, when there's local switching or through a tunnel, a special OpenV switch called the, the tunnel OpenV switch. Uh, to, and it automatically builds VXLAN tunnels over the physical infrastructure so that there is a layer two connectivity between the virtual machines. This happens under the hood and if we see the topology of OpenStack, uh, then we, we can see virtual machines apparently connected in layer two uh, between each other, but may, they may actually be going through an IP network. They, maybe this layer two network, which is represented here with four switches, it can also be an IP network, a routed network, an MPLS network. Uh, but as long as there is connectivity between the servers, then OpenStack can build this tunnel. So the IP or the Ethernet infrastructure that is interconnecting the compute nodes doesn't have to be aware of this tunneling, doesn't have to be aware of this addressing. It, it just sees the IP addresses of the, of the servers, just that. So OpenStack's SDN controller, we would say, which is a, one of the components of Neutron, I think it's using a Python SDN controller under the hood. Is building these PXLAN tunnels, is controlling them, the, their life cycle, I mean, it's creating them, it's, it's tearing them down when, when they are no longer needed. Uh, but this imposes a performance limit, which we, that may, may be reasonable for most of our workloads, uh, of about uh, one gigabit per second uh, using these switches. And if we use libraries as DPDK, then we should dedicate some CPUs for these switches. And um, as I mentioned earlier, bypass the kernel space so that this switch can perform a little bit more. But even with, with these uh, techniques, we, we don't get the most out of the NIC, right? So if we really need high performance in a virtual network function, we need to enable SROB or pass-through to connect the virtual machine directly to the NIC. So as I said, for using VXL antennas, which is what we see by default most of the time, um, we just need IP connectivity between the compute nodes and that's it. Using SRL beer pass through, we okay expose the VM to the NIC directly. The virtual machine now is is going to be able to to send more information. It will have more throughput uh, because it won't have the limitations of OBS. But and I will take the opportunity to answer one of the questions there. Um, it won't benefit from the security groups, for example, features or port security features that OpenStack implements using the virtual switch. It just exposes the interface and you're on your own there uh, with whatever you can implement in the physical layer to orchestrate connectivity, first of all, and of course security or whatever you want to do uh, between these interfaces. Even DHCP is not uh, enabled by default here because in uh, for getting IP addressing here, we have a network node in OpenStack that has a namespace. Well, it's just uh, a service 
that uh, implements a DHCP server that delivers IP addresses for each of the VXLANs uh, we have here enabled and connects, of course, to this open vSwitch infrastructure uh, as it was an extra VM, is a DHCP server. But in this case, we don't no, no longer have a way to connect this DHCP server naturally. We will have to do it through the physical uh, network outside. So there's a lot to be done after we enable SROV. It's, just, it's not just a matter of enabling SROV and forgetting. Uh, it depends on what you have outside. Um, the, the, the options you have to interconnect the virtual machines, to give them security, to give them addressing. Okay, so you get a lot of performance. This is used a lot in production environments because you need that performance on network functions. Um, but you need to care about this. How is, is this being... Um, done today. Usually when there is no orchestration in place, I mean end-to-end -end orchestration, operators are using SROV and then they are manually configuring the switches so that they get a connectivity. So whatever happens here, uh, if you don't have orchestration, most of the time it's being done manually. I mean configuring the, VL, the VLANs, configuring the VXLANs, uh, or whatever you have in there, or configuring the, the IP addressing, uh, whatever you need to get this configured. Then probably assigning the IP addresses manually to the virtual machines because you don't have a DHCP server dedicated to that VLAN. Um, probably adding some security, some firewall in the middle to, to protect the virtual machine or implementing some IP tables inside the, the, the operating system of a virtual machine. So there's a lot of things to, to be done. So SDN Assist uh, is a feature of OSM that takes care of this configuration. First of all, we have noticed that OSM orchestrates SROV or pass-through with assigning the physical interfaces to the VM. I mean, PFs, physical functions, which is how we call a pass-through interface or a physical NIC uh, when it's used completely for a, a virtual machine. Or a virtual functions that is uh, the, having the, the NIC virtualized in many uh, PCI addresses so I can share the NIC with many virtual machines. So this part, okay, we already reviewed how to, to do it. We just put it in the, in the model that we want SROV. And given that you have a compute node configured for SROV, then it, it will put the VM in there and assign a VF to it. But then you have SDN Assist. So OpenStack through Arrow communicates to, uh, sorry, OSM through Arrow communicates to OpenStack and uh, instantiates the virtual machines in the compute nodes, assigns the PCI addresses of the, of the NIC, of the virtual functions, and what SDN Assist does is through a plugin, and to correct this here, it's not an open flow API, it's, it's a, a plugin that it uses to communicate with an SDN controller, which is external, um, which may use open flow or other mechanisms to communicate with the fabric, it will take care of the connectivity. How does open OSM knows uh, what to connect or um, if it needs to connect to ports at all. Well, well, whenever you have a VLD that has two SROV ports that need to connect to each other, then OSM will try to detect which port is configured, is connected to, to the port assigned to the virtual machine. And for that, it needs to grab the PCI address that OpenStack uh, or the MAC addresses that OpenStack assigned uh, in the compute node, and then pass this information to the SDN controller, who will, who will in turn um, return the address of the ports or the, the, the ports themselves so that OSM can say, okay, uh, interconnect those ports, and SD, the SDN controller would do so through its southbound APIs, which can be 
open flow, can be a net conf, can be any mechanism that would allow uh, to configure an ELAN or an ELINE. I mean, VXLAN, VLANs, um, open flow, flows, or whatever. Okay, so back to this picture here. SDN Assist will uh, take care of this VXLAN open flow or VLAN configurations. It depends on the SDN controller or configuration manager because we can call everything an SDN controller. Uh, through plugins, it sends instructions, please interconnect the ports that are assigned to these PCI addresses between each other, and the SDN controller will do so. So in this way, SDN uh, OSM is is uh, taking care of the underlay connectivity. As of, and I will correct this on the fly, sorry, as of 710, uh, the supported plugins are these Onos, Arista, Open Daylight, and Floodlight. So we have three open source and, and one proprietary. However, uh, control is on a way to what version of OpenFlow is used. That's not the, we would say the, I think that would matter to OSM. Um, it, 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 that's, it, that is just uh, the communication between the SDN controller and the switches. So OSM is abstracted from that. That belongs to the layer of SDN controlling. In this case, for example, if I have switches that support OpenFlow 1.3 and I have a Onos controller that supports that version 2, it will communicate through those agents using OpenFlow. I mean, Open Source Mano used to talk an OpenFlow API in the past. Now it's using plugins to uh, talk to the SDN controllers and say, I just want co to connect these two ports. And the SDN controller will take care of the rest. So it's not necessarily open flow. It will be whatever it's implemented in between the SDN controller and the, and the fabric to interconnect two ports. Okay. So what do we need to have SDN assist in our environment? First of all, we need to create, well, given that we have an infrastructure that supports already SRLV or pass through, which is another thing. I can share some documents. I, I've uh, been asked uh, to share a lot of times this kind of, of documentation on how to enable SRI SRIOB in an NAPI. So I, I will share that uh, to the group. Uh, but besides that, which is a, an NAPI thing, uh, given that you have support for SRIOB and pass through, uh, you have to specify when you create the bin at OSM that it has a data plane physical network with a, a name or a set of physical networks with a name. Um, at least that. Then you need a compatible SDN controller or configuration manager because not everything is, can be called an SDN controller. If, if you're using OpenFlow, definitely this is an SDN controller. If you are uh, talking to maybe a Arista uh, controller, that in turn uh, uses OBSDB or NetConf to configure its uh, switches, then probably it's just configuration and not abstraction, so it's a config manager, but, but uh, it doesn't matter. It, it is a platform that will, be a, will let OSM um, interconnect two ports, and it, it needs to become a compatible one. So as I mentioned, uh, the most popular is the controllers are supported, and Arista uh, up to this date. Uh, I have a question there. What happens if the two VMs to be connected through SDN Assist land in the same compute node? Does OSM still talk to the SDN controller and the traffic still go in and out of the NIC? No, in that case, well, actually it depends. If they land in the same compute node, but in different interfaces, then yes, we need to talk to the SDN controller because the traffic would flow through the switch, through the external switch, at least the top of the rack switch. But if the PCI addresses land 
in the same NIC, then the compute node will take care of the, of the switching. So in that case, there, there is no communication with the SCM controller. OSM would handle that automatically. And you will see that if capacity is in our favor, uh, you will see that uh, today because we have just two servers enabled for SROV. So most or many of you would may, may use the same. Okay, what else? The Beam user must have administration privileges uh, to get the PCI information or, well, it, the test uh, the tests we have done so far uh, we always set the, op the the open stack user as admin however there should be a setting in the policy of nova api that should uh, let us get this pci information i personally have not found it found it yet i've tested some settings and the policy of of nova api and uh, i'm not getting information but there must be certainly a way to, to give a non-admin user access to the PCI information. So you need that. Uh, otherwise, your instantiation will hand because it will um, keep trying to get the PCI information and OpenStack will not deliver it. Finally, the Beam and SDN controller must be configured properly in OSM. So you need to, uh, the same way you add a beam, you will need to add an SDN controller. And you need to, to tell the, the beam, here you, you have this SDN controller, use it in case you need to um, instantiate a, a VM which needs this interconnectivity. There's more information here. This is the OSM user guide. So we're telling uh, here how to create an SDN controller, uh, how to interact with SDN controllers, how to associate an SDN controller to a beam. We can see here the types of SDN controllers. We have Onos VPLS, Onos OpenFlow, Plotlight OpenFlow, Beam Pack, ODL OpenFlow, well, it says upcoming, uh, but in 7.0.0, we would have at least Arista. 7.1.0, sorry. Uh, then how to associate the SDN controller to a beam? You need, uh, in certain cases, you need to tell manually uh, OSM how these PCI addresses map to each compute node and, and, and how, uh, how these PCI addresses map to which switch port. So you need to tell this because some in some mechanisms are not uh, ready to automate this relationship. So I, I just got that question. How OSM knows which switch port a NIC port is connected to? Through this mapping file, which is built once and then you forget. And you can update, of course, anytime you want. Um, there are certain other mechanisms to get this information. As far as I know, the Arista one is not needed, it's not needing the mapping. So in that case, we would say mapping not needed true. Uh, because it gets that information in some other way. Uh, since that is new, um, I don't have the details now. And then you can show the, the beam and you will see that the beam is associated to an SDN controller and that has a specific map. Okay, um, so there are some details as well here on how to configure OpenStack for SRIOV. It's, it's covering the OpenStack configuration. It's not covering the, how to enable uh, this mechanism at all in, in the server. So that information is the one we can complement. Okay. So back to our scenario. Uh, as I mentioned, we will migrate this S1 interface, which today is using VXLAN, to uh, SROV. So it will go out of our servers. We have 
two servers enabled for this. So most of so all the VMs will land in these two servers. Uh, and then the, uh, depending on if the VDU is in the same server as the other VDU, you will use the physical switch or not. You may land in the same compute node and OSM will say, okay, you don't need uh, the, the open flow flows. Um, but if they land in different servers, then there will be a communication with, in this case, we're using an ONOS controller to interact with the physical data plane. So now we will prepare our environment. Um, let me guide you through these commands here. We we'll, we'll need to run them very carefully. I will access my tenant and show you right away. Uh, the first command that we will run is OSM SDN create with the name of your controller. We will put just for power identification, I will put here my tenant number. Make sure you put it, please. We will use Onos VPLS because this will let us um, configure multiple open flow open flow and um, flows in the multiple switches that interconnect these servers so that it implements a kind of VPLS uh, service. Uh, the URL is this one. This is where our SDN controller is. Okay. Uh, 248.57, this is the ONOS controller. You will see here that there are three switches. Uh, 99 is our, you would say, a spine switch. And then we have the leaf switches, uh, number 1, 11, and 12. So they connect the, the the servers that we are using. So we will be using just two of them. Um, okay, so user caraf and password caraf. I will paste this in my environment. Okay. Now, we need the SDN port mapping file. I'll guide you, guide you through it. Now, and let me show you how it looks like. Well, it's just this. We have three servers. Right now, two of them are enabled, as I mentioned. And it maps the PCI address, each PCI address that is possible to have uh, with a switch port on a specific switch. So all of these. Uh, and the Mac is irrelevant, uh, just an extra argument that we are not using here. So all of these 60, I think it's 64 PCIs per NIC are mapped to port number one of each switch. Okay, that's the way it works. But if that's already built, so please just download it using this command here. And finally, update here your tenant number so that you update your beam, put the name of your ONOS controller, and specify the SDN port mapping file that you just downloaded. And this will map the three elements, the beam with the SDN controller and the mapping. So now we are ready. But we need to tell our VNF to use SROV ports. So in this case, as you can see, what we have to do next is to update our VNFB. We are not um, rebuilding the package. Just for simplicity, we will go to the dashboard of OSM and change the lines manually, okay? 
So you go to the VNF packages section, then look for this VNF, that is the VNF that includes the two VDUs, Magma Access Gateway and the you know, the emulator is our SRS LTE. And then in the section that corresponds to Magma Access Gateway, there is an Ethernet zero that belongs to the S1 interface. That um, you will put SRIOV there instead of, of, of Virtio or Parabirt or whatever you have there. Um, that's in my case line 96. If you are using the same descriptors, that should be your case too. And then in the same file, you should go to line uh, 144, and there you should find the S1 interface of SRS LTE. And you should change the type to SRLV. So be careful to select the right. Um, interfaces is F1, F0 and F1. Be careful because sometimes uh, one interface is next to the other and you may make a mistake. So I will do this myself, or I, I think I already have it, but I'll see. Uh, actually, in this machine, I don't have packages, so I will uh, update the packages, recover packages. Okay, so 57 is open to no. So you will find your DNF package that belongs to MagMax's gateway. And line 96, you see Paravit there, belongs to the S1. You put SR dash IOV, exactly this. Otherwise, it won't be recognized. And then in line 144, same thing. Update. Okay. So now, what's next? After you updated your VNF package, uh, the scriptor in particular, you are ready to launch your network service, network slice, sorry, instance with the given script. It's important that you use it. I don't know if this was mentioned before, but it's using some optimizations for UU so that uh, the amount of traffic and operations that the, that the proxy charms uh, need to run are, are reduced and we reduce collisions in between uh, your different network services or LXCs machines implementing proxy charms to be specific. Okay, so you then launch this. And uh, everything will look more or less the same. Maybe the virtual machine will take a little bit more time. Uh, I will do it myself just to see. I, I don't want I, I don't want to consume resources because um, we don't know if the switch pages will be enough for everybody. But let's see. I'll launch this first and then let you play with this. Okay, let's explore this. So we have the two VMs active, the EPC or access gateway and the emulator. We have this uh, network in purple here, which is the S1 interface that interconnects both, right? It looks the same, but if I click on it, network is slow today and probably the system as well. But what we should expect to see is that this uh, network is different from the typical networks that we that are created. Is first of all, it's of type VLAN. It's not VXLAN. It belongs to a different FISNET. It's FISNET two. So it's a VLAN that belongs to physical network two, and it's given a segmentation ID of. 1098. Okay, I will show you some extra information regarding uh, SROV. So these are the two servers that we have. First of all, they have some switch pages assigned. 
we can see with this command, meminfo, grep huge pages, or grep huge, uh, how many huge pages we have already there. I see that there have been already some deployments because we have a lot of huge pages used. Um, that is because SRIOV automatically enables huge pages, CPU pinning, and pneumatopology awareness in OSM. Okay, so we don't need to enable that manually in the descriptor. It's all happening automatically because otherwise OSM um, is designed, uh, the, the way this was designed, as I explained earlier, is that if you are using SRIOV, then you need a lot of throughput. If you need a lot of, of, of throughput from your VM, then you need these other EPA techniques uh, to have the resources to deal with this new throughput uh, available. Okay, first of all that. Then we have, I'm, I'm showing again the compute nodes here, okay? I will show you a IP link command. Okay, so we got some VLANs already there. This, is, this command is showing just the interface Okay, the interface, it is virtualized to have 64 locations that you can use. In this case, it has assigned around 17 or something here and here. I'll just put enable to show the ones that are actually enabled. Okay, it's like 16, 17 per server. I will look for my case, which is VLAN 1098, which OSM assigned automatically. So it's the VF55 in one server, and it's probably assigning me two servers, 57 and 55, okay? So I'm landing my videos in different servers. That means I will see some activity at my SDN controller, right? So here is my SDN controller. And as I mentioned, we're using two switches. So forget about switch number one, we're using switch number 11 and 12. Let's explore the flows of this one. So I click on one, and whenever this uh, window appears, I click on flows. Have a lot of flows there, and there is a flow for my VLAN here, 1098. This is a flow installed for me, for my video. In the other case, uh, the other switch, that 9011, same thing. I will look for my VLAN, 1098, there it is. So there is communication between each other. Now I will access a, a magma access gateway with this IP address around here, which is a management one. And I should be able to see, no, I will access, sorry, I will access the, the other one because it will give us more tools to see things, okay? So if you access the other one, the SRS LTE and quick tip, since that, L, that, that uh, machine is using a uh, native charm, it automatically tells us the management address if we run a UU status. Okay, so just access your SRS LTE VDU through its management interface. You can also find it here at a network topology or network instances. I'll put the password. Okay, so this is the VM here to the right here. It's using VLAN 1098 to connect to the EPC through the switches that we have seen. So we should see, if I run EF, IF config, uh, that we have a N6 besides the management interface. Let's explore this further and run an LSPCI rep Ethernet, and we see two interfaces. One is a virtual network device, and the other one 
is an Intel Corporation Ethernet Virtual Function 700 series. So this is the VF. And of course, this image of which is a Ubuntu Bionic has a driver to know about, to know how to recognize this card and is directly exposed. So if I pin finally 192.168.100.254, which is the address of the magma con the magma test gateway on the other side, we should wait a minute or a couple of seconds for the controller to recognize this. We should see traffic. Let's go to oh there it is. So it took a while for probably the SDN controller is so overwhelmed as well. It's a small Docker container for everybody. So uh, the the controller installed the flows because it needs to install the flows through all the way. I mean there needs to be flows not only topology, not only in the edge switches. but also in the spine switch. Keep using my switches. Okay. I will just refresh this. Okay, so if, since I'm generating traffic and I click on hosts with the letter H, I'm able to see my hosts there. If I click on, I guess, P, no, it's uh, T, well, let's see. Traffic highlighting it's this port stats. And I send a lot of traffic, probably, I don't know, in size 1500 and timeout zero. I may get some interesting thing. Okay, so you, as you can see, we have traffic, a lot of traffic flowing between one server and the other through 11 and 12 switches. And that's just because this S1 interface here, which we map through SRO interfaces, um, are going through virtual functions in different servers. So OSM went to Onos SDN controller, installed or uh, told the SDN controller Give me connectivity between these two ports. The SDN controller on us installed these um, flows throughout, throughout the way. And that's why we have traffic. And of course, if this is a physical fabric of high performance and we have 40 gig uh, NICs, uh, we will get a lot of uh, throughput for my network function. Okay, so despite this warning, Things work, and this is the way SDN Assist um, helps orchestrate the end-to-end. -end. We have our final picture. If we go back and quickly review everything, we have launched a packet core with SRS emulator. Uh, imagine a production case where you are deploying these packet cores everywhere in a distributed fashion. It comes with its own emulator, which is a small virtual machine, so that you can quickly see that it works before uh, having actually uh, the users come in and you know this installed. Uh, then we are getting high performance. We can test throughput through uh, the physical physical switch to see if we if if our EPC performs well, and we have also controlled an external router, uh, which is tied to our specific a scenario with a specific address that we want to visit internet. We have orchestrated some automation with this element here uh, and this other element here, the web cache, the KNF, so that uh, our for, uh, packet core is registered and also for our packet core to be able to send traffic uh, in a secure way. So we have seen really an end-to-end -end case and I think that this is the first time that we uh, in a hack fest, do this end-to-end -end scenario. It has been a uh, first opportunity. Of course, this is not the last session, so we will have 
uh, opportunity for you to, to give feedback. But uh, I would like to, 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 to tell you that um, it's, it's really an achievement to see uh, people uh, work with SROV and these advanced use cases in a hack fest, um, despite the capacity problems that, of course, are natural uh, because we, we, it's, it's hard to calculate how uh, resources will behave in advance. Uh, because we, we want to give tenants to everybody so so that everybody is able to test. Anyway, um, I hope that most of you have been able to use this. The one thing I was worried about is the huge pages allocation. It seems we have huge pages, but anyway, these huge pages are distributed between different um, nodes. So since there's a restriction on using just one node, uh, we may not be able to instantiate all the virtual machines. So uh, uh, we, I just need to monitor that in case someone experiences uh, an error with a VM. 